um, second talk of the morning is by uh, Serxis Archiwala, as you can see here. Serxis is a member of SPECS, he's here also at UPF. And uh, Serxis uh, actually was, was with us in a, in, a, in a BCBT ages ago, <laughs> when he was still working in Amsterdam, uh, more in physics, right? You, you were in the physics department in Amsterdam, no? right? But he had this interest in, in, in brain and, and um, mind. Uh, that's also what brought him into BCBT. And then he started to apply his knowledge in physics and math to a number of problems in, in brain science. And already in that BCBT session, that was such a success that he started, decided to move from Amsterdam to Barcelona, even though he preferred the weather and the food in Amsterdam. Um, so, and since then, he has never left, uh, except to travel around the world to present his, his results. So success is, is one of these uh, success examples of, of a crossover, right? where people who come from more these formal domains, <laughs> physics and math, discover that actually the hard problems of this century are in trying to understand the brain. And Serx has made great contributions to that challenge by really looking into different kinds of, of quantifications, measures, also information theoretical measures, that help us to get also more quantitative you know, hook and grasp on, on the properties of brains and minds that he will share with us today in his talk about the brain and, and complexity and the networks of the brain. So Sergio, it's great that you're here. Now as a speaker, just in a few years' time, you see you can go from audience to speaker in BCBT. So use this as your example. So welcome. Thank you. Am I audible at the back? OK, good. So um, I changed the topic a bit. Uh, I'm going to talk on the network brain. and. Um, uh, what, what, I, what I'm going to talk to you today about is, uh, is an emerging field in, in biological science, especially in the brain sciences, which, uh, which uh, combines ideas from uh, network science, physics, biology, information theory, and even control engineering. And more and more it's becoming obvious that to understand the brain, we need this kind of approach where ideas from fields outside of traditional neuroscience are being used to great effect. So. Um, uh, in, in today's talk, I'll, I'll give you an overview of the, of the field, the work that we have been doing, and um, we'll, a, a lot of this talk today will be focused on brain diseases because uh, that, that's a very good application area to test these type of ideas. So let's first, straight away, as Paul said, we, what are the big challenges that we face? So you might have heard this over the last few years, the omics challenge. Uh, now, most of the time when you hear about this kind of thing, it's often sold as, oh, there's the big data problem. You can look at it that way, and you can just say, well, the bigger the data, just use some more blind machine learning algorithms, which can be useful for cert certain problems and to certain extents. But it's becoming more and more uh, clear that for biology, and especially for the brain, we need to have a more principled approach uh, to towards understanding uh, cognition and disease. And so, so what's the scope of the uh, system we are facing? If you look at systems neuroscience, uh, usually we, uh, neuroscience traditionally has looked at neurons, and that's why it's called neuroscience. Maybe a better, a better word is due. Uh, that's why I didn't, uh, my original title was neuroscience, but then I changed that. Uh, so here, here you, uh, many of these figures are actual data. They are not just, uh, you know, they are not just WordPress images from Wikipedia. Uh, so, so this is actually a snapshot from, uh, of the human brain connectome data. In this case, this is white matter connectivity, uh, white matter fiber connectivity across the entire cerebral cortex. Uh, data from Patrick Hugman uh, collected about 2008. And right now, as you know, the, the big brain projects, the human connectome projects, have much more massive data of, of this type, um, going to almost, um, um, in, this, in this particular example, it's 1,000 voxels, but the current standards are almost 80,000, 100,000 voxels. So, so that's the scope of just neuronal uh, type of connectivity. But the brain is not just neurons, and that is just misleading to think about it. And uh, what, what has happened in the last few years is that other areas in biology have made great progress, and we have begun to realize that those things are really, really useful for some of the problems we address in cognition and disease. And uh, uh, so, so what, what, what other things are there that might be important for understanding the brain at that systems level? So uh, for, for many years, people have, uh, um, I mean, biology has broken up into several departments. You have the genomics, 
and a few years ago there was the human genome project now there has been great progress in human gene uh, in uh, gene sequencing and they and you might have heard in the last few years there have been new new technologies uh, called uh, uh, new sequ uh, new generation sequencing methods to sequence the entire human genome to pinpoint it. so you could you could make a book with your entire genome and and i think chris venter uh, craig venter who has been leading uh, much of spearheading much of this effort he is trying to sequence the entire genome and show it in public some of this data is available too then here you have the the human proteome uh, data set uh, this is part of the protein protein interaction network so here what you have is you, the dna codes for genes and genes express proteins you have about um, roughly in, in most of this talk we are just talking about humans okay you can always go for other species that's a different story so what are the numbers like you have approximately uh, 20000 known genes which express multiple types of proteins. So the protein network has approximately 90,000 90, proteins and s mul multiply that factor by the number of interactions that you have within them. So the, the human proteome project uh, was uh, recently published in Nature. Uh, so so this, is, this is the data from 2007, but recently the human proteome uh, has been mapped uh, about two years ago it was published in nature and and yet what has been mapped is still an incomplete data set which means there is more interactions we still don't know of and probably there are still more proteins we haven't discovered and then on top of that once you understand the protein protein interactions then there's the cell signaling cycles and cell signaling circuits uh, which are which can be important for various functions so I, I'll quickly tell you what fun what functionalities they might be and then you go to the level from the cell to the brain but you don't stop there at the brain uh, because the brain doesn't work in isolation. If you just took out a brain of somebody, it's not going, you know, I mean, no, no one has tried it, but except in the movie Robocop, there also, you see, they had to make that robot pretty good. It was not just the brain. And you need the nervous system and you need the vascular system. I'll say a little bit more about this highly ignored system. Very recent data also from the va human vascular network about uh, 2013. And what's still missing here is, uh, well, it's not just uh, neurons. It's glia astrocytes, the supporting uh, structure in the brain. And the most extremely important, the immune system. And people have recently begun to realize that the immune system is not just useful for immune diseases, but also for some brain diseases where it might be useful. So now when you think about it at the systems level, you realize that several disorders of, of I mean, there, there are lots more disorders, but let's say within our department of neuroscience or whatever that is, if we are interested in brain disease, we possibly cannot ignore all these other interactions that influence the brain both ways. So uh, in, in, the, in this example, for, exa uh, for instance, uh, the, 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 this, this specific cell signaling circuit is taken from this work of Grautner et al. Um, and this was actually, this specific thing is the CAM kinase pathway. You might have heard of it sometimes, but uh, uh, this specific circuit was, is useful for understanding uh, spike timing uh, dependent plasticity STDP. And, and that's a mechanism that is used in human memory. So as you know, memory is not just at the level of neurons, it's at the level of synaptic plasticity. And this specific circuit is just one signaling pathway within a single synapse that influences, influences your memory. So there already you see, you, you, you start using these molecular mechanisms to understand memory and there's quite a bit of extensive work on that. Then uh, you might start looking over here at, uh, at proteomic interactions and the, these uh, pro uh, interactions between proteins influence your metabolic pathways, your cellular pathways, and what type of mutations you might have at the genetic level influence not only your morphology, your structural morphology, but they also influence the, the modulation of the electrochemical activity at the neuronal level. So the neuronal level is influenced or modulated, or if you like to think about it, perturbed by all these other levels. And then the brain, so to say, feeds back into the body because you need the body for action. You have heard some excellent talks in the last few days uh, in BCBT for, for that. And uh, the, the nervous system, as you see, uh, you know, so sometimes this demarcation of brain and body is a little bit vague. Uh, if you do experiments with uh, smaller animals, you realize that it's hard to really just put the brain at the head and say everything else is not the brain because there is a, the, the, the neurons connect through the spinal cord, you have the nervous system, which are also neurons actually, and that system uh, inter, uh, is, is then um, uh, used to drive uh, various bodily functions. You have the autonomous peripheral nervous system, central nervous system, etc. And um, uh, 
And, and finally, what's the role of the vasculature? I mean, be besides all this stuff, there are blood vessels in the brain, and of course the rest of the body, but let's focus on the brain. You have blood, the whole blood vessel system in the brain, the arteries, the veins, and they, the role that they play is to uh, bring in nutrients and to flush out uh, waste, uh, toxic waste uh, from, the, uh, from the system. Now, of course, this is important for lots of things, sleep, uh, aware, awareness, etc. But in disease, where does it matter? So now, what I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is that uh, so first of all, a lot of these data sets are actually available, the, the genome data, proteomic data, vascular data, even the connectome data, almost all of this data set I'm showing you uh, is more or less available freely, freely on the internet. Um, so I'm not telling, I'm not suggesting that just put everything together and let the mix evolve. That's not going to happen. Uh, we, to, to understand things in terms of principles, we need to understand which are the important parts for specific questions we want to ask. So let's take an example. Let's take stroke. Stroke is not just a disease of the brain, mean, meaning that stroke is not just a disease where a tissue of your neurons or a brain area or the cortical area got affected. It's also a disease of the uh, vasculature. What happens in stroke is that there's a blood clot at, the, at one of the arterial levels, which simply shuts off any supply of uh, oxygen and metabolites to some part of the brain tissue. And because of that, that tissue has died. So, so what, what happens is, uh, the, the, I mean, what, then, then what, what you can think of, uh, um, I mean, at, at, at this stage you can say, okay, fine. Maybe the vasculature caused it, but ultimately it was the uh, cortical tissue that died. So uh, let's just focus on the cortex. But then if you start thinking of therapy, if you understand that these things happen at different levels, when you uh, think of therapy, whether it is drug, uh, neuroprosthetics, or other forms of rehabilitation, you can actually start attacking different systems for therapy. You don't just have to work at one level. So you might start repairing the vascular network rather than just trying to focus on the neurons because on their own, the, the neurons might not be able to uh, completely uh, regrow on their own. But you might have other ways, and I'll, in, towards the end of the talk, I will show you one, I will at least mention one experiment where they have actually tried to do that by, uh, using, a, um, uh, by, by using a prosthetic device at, at, this, at the vascular level to gain some effect here. But that's not for humans. But anyway, it's a, it's a good direction to go further. So, um, so this was one example of, for stroke where you need to look at these two. For other diseases like uh, 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 autism, Alzheimer's, diabetes, you might uh, already know people often say you have some genetic influence or some genes. Y usually what, what, you're, what you hear is, is just very, a, small, a small part of the picture. In reality, uh, you, don't have, uh, you don't have just one gene or uh, a, a simple combination, but you have several genes interacting that cause a disease. And what happens is that those gene interactions, along with the, uh, the, the neuronal interactions, give rise to this entire complex. So that, that actually makes us rethink what do we mean by disease? What is disease? And, and that's, uh, so first we try to think about what's a new way of thinking of disease in terms of network science. Network science offers us the tools and, uh, and, the, uh, and some measures to deal with this systems level problem. So, to summarize what I've said over here, uh, what are the big questions in systems neuroscience that we want to uh, address? What are the big challenges? The brain operates at different levels, uh, from micro, meso, uh, macro. And these different levels have interesting theoretical principle mechanisms. So just looking at data blindly is senseless. It's very, very necessary to look, to look at principles and theory. And you saw a great talk b uh, by Daniel before, also emphasizing uh, th uh, the role of uh, princ a principle way of thinking into it. So, uh, what, what this would mean is that you need to under, and, and in, in a way, what you want to know is, remember one thing, uh, you know, like they say, the most detailed map of, the play, of a given place is the place itself. So any map or any data, for, so to say, will always be a subclass representation of the whole system. And also due to re realistic uh, problems, data is always having a lot of missing data. When you have data, there's a lot, often a lot more missing data, simply because it takes time to know it, it's difficult, or you cannot see through it. And, and then you have to make sense from the observed data what the rest of the system looks like, what its dynamics might be, and you, and you do simulations in order to fill those gaps, and then you try to uh, do analyze it 
in a principled way because now if, if these data sets are this big, uh, some of those uh, the, like the human connectome project data set, probably uh, you would have a tough time just computing a correlation matrix on a laptop like this. You might have to start using your cluster or something and, and that's a fact. I'm not even, I'm not even exaggerating it. So uh, you, if you just apply machine learning methods blindly like deep networks, etc., you'll get something interesting. Fine. I, I have no complaints about it. But uh, if you if you try to ground your your uh, thinking or analysis in good theory and good principles, you will probably realize insights of how to look at that data better. Uh, and um, so uh, so that so that will be one thing we will address. Uh, we will look at a few examples of some diseases and how we do that here at, at Specs. Uh, we look a little bit on on information processing. Luckily, Daniel has given a great talk on uh, in information theory, and he's also the world expert. So. Uh, since he has covered much material on that, it might make my job a little easier there. And in the end, what I want to come, come to is, what do we do with all this? Okay, fine. You look at all this uh, big data approach, you look at a systems level, you look at theory, you look at network theory, but what do we do with that? The, main, the point over here is, one is to understand uh, the mechanisms, but the more important thing is, if you understand how do you design therapy, and for that, we will be using principles from control engineering. Control theory is of, often uh, thought of as something to do with robotics, but here is control theory in biology and how it leads to new biotherapies. So that's, that's what we will be more or less uh, discussing today. What's the outline of this talk? Uh, now, network science is a huge field, but I'm just focusing on how these principles uh, can be applied to cognition, disease, and therapy. Uh, you have already, you have probably seen examples uh, of these, you know, like pockets of these examples you must have heard, heard of them a lot in, in different situations, but now let's bring it all together. So uh, when, when I say network thinking, uh, we, are, we are saying that, well, if you have a, a, a multi-level systems problem, one nice representation to think of that system might be by thinking about it as networks of networks. Uh, it's, it's, now, now, what is a network? You have nodes and edges. The nodes are basic entities, which might have some mechanism, and the edges are interactions. So you define some mechanism, you define some interactions, and then on top of that, you have a complex structure, you might have some dynamics, and you might have flow of signals, information, and often what happens in complex systems is when they get complex enough, the, the word has to be better defined, uh, you have interesting uh, collective phenomena that emerge. Sometimes you might have heard of these things like self-organizing principles or something like that. But the, the important thing is that when you put, uh, when you have a large system uh, of interactions, uh, not, not completely random, but with some, with some basic design, either a topological or a dynamical design, you look at, uh, at the macro level, you see interesting phenomena which are not a direct addition of lower level things. And, and, and at times you hear, you hear this saying, uh, is the whole greater than the sum of the parts? And, and in a lot of complex systems, you, you see that yes, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, but what is this greater part? How is it greater? What are the principles? And can you compute it? What does it mean? So we will, we will look at some of those questions. Uh, with regard to cognition, you already, I already told you that these exam, like memory, learning, and these things require you to think at multi-level, uh, in terms of multi-level approach. With language, you will also see that even uh, for, for, for language, you can think about it in an, as a network, in an, from a network perspective, and why that is more useful than thinking about it traditionally, where language was su just supposed to be associated with one or two specific brain areas. So the old thinking was, I mean, of course, that thinking was because of the limits of what you could experiment in those days. So it's not that those people were silly, it's because of what they could do. But now we are at a time where technology and experimentation has gone so far that it's time that we improve the theories based on these new things. So in, in the old days, language was supposed to be uh, something that, that depends just on the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area. But now you will see that language networks are much more complex. And this, and this we did a specific study on brain tumor patients. So you will see a bit of that. I already spoke about why com uh, diseases are not just Again, diseases are not just modular, uh, modular effects of a subpart of the brain, but they are things that are networkopathies. So what happens is that when you make a perturbation at one point, it influences the whole of the system because there are these interactions at multi levels. So um, if, if I mean, in a way, health and disease are quite 
uh, precarious. It's, it's like a balancing act. It's not literally that bad, but imagine you're balancing many, many things. You know, you have, you're, if you make a slight perturbation at one level, it will influence something else, like, like um, some multi-level uh, slide or something, and you have to be really careful. In a way, with some exaggeration, health is like that, and disease, disease is a perturbation to health. So when, 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 I, when I say I'm interested in disease, in a way, it's not that uh, cognition and disease are two different things, like cognition part of the cognitive neuroscience department and disease part of the medicine department. It's that disease is a perturbation of a specific cognitive function. So if you want to understand how cognition works, you have to understand what happens to cognition when there's a perturbation. It is part of the same system. To, 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 you know, to, to understand something, you have to understand what are its variations. You, uh, you can't just learn something by just looking at one snapshot of it. If you look at its variations, you understand what remains invariant, what principles remain invariant, and what changes, and what's really crucial for that, for that uh, function or dysfunction. And finally, uh, once you understand that, then therapy will be at the, uh, I mean, this is standard therapy, but what I want to emphasize in this talk is that all these therapeutic approaches, if you think about them in terms of networks and control, then you can think of uh, uh, new, new, uh, virtual neurosurgery, network level drugs, neuro simulations that use control engineering principles, et cetera. So how, uh, we, we'll see a few examples and we see how that works. Th this was to s set up the stage for the problem. Is everything okay? There was a noise yeah. emanating from the space somewhere. <laughs> 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 it is resolved now. I was not not hallucinating. No, that was just a wake up <laughs> alarm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let's um, be, before I talk about our own work, um, let's. Um, I mean, much of what I'm saying is is quite recent stuff. Let's see what how how this field has been developing out a little bit outside of the neurosciences and what principles we can learn from that. So let's look at network medicine. From the side of people, uh, from the side of people who study genomics, the 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 the, the people who uh, work at the level of genes and molecules, uh, what what have they to tell us, and uh, what can we learn? So they, uh, a few years ago, they have developed, they had, uh, there has been a, a field called network medicine, uh, but mostly confined to to genes and gene interactions, and uh, within that thinking, and also a little, then then it also emanated a, a bit in other fields. Uh, they they started thinking about disease slightly differently, and, and that makes sense at a systems level. So let, let's look at this picture over here. What you see over here is this is just a cartoon, so, uh, but the other things are real data. Let's take an example of a couple of diseases, end diseases, etc. Now, this disease is uh, known to be associated to some, some number of symptoms, okay? Uh, the weights over here, so in, in this specific example, the way they did it is they didn't really look at some brain catalog, but they looked at seven million PubMed papers, and they just did text mining, and they looked for, uh, in, the, in, this, in this text mining approach, uh, what are the symptoms that are associated to disease, this disease and how often it happens. So, so I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, you, when you do statistics, you have to, of course, care about, what type, uh, how to account for the errors, etc. But that's a different thing. Y here, these people have done some uh, some some serious work. So, uh, what what do we see here? We see that e a, a given disease has some set of symptoms, but another given disease has some symptoms which will overlap with the other one. And often you see that uh, multiple diseases share some partial sets of symptoms. Um, but that's not all. What also happens is, you already know this uh, from your own experiences, um, when you have a given disease or you know someone who has, and there might be some common symptoms that, that are known to be associated, but from person to person, from patient to patient, the symptoms themselves are not always the same. So it, you think of it as the same disease because there might be some underlying mechanism, but the symptoms are not always the same. On the other hand, there are overlapping symptoms in multiple diseases. And, and this happens because, uh, okay, so at the genetic level, these people will say, well, a given gene can express multiple proteins, so a mutation of that gene can cause a uh, dysfunction of multiple proteins, or multiple uh, genes can lead to, uh, so, so a given gene leads to multiple proteins, meaning from that to multiple symptoms. On the other hand, a given symptom, uh, uh, a, a, um, a given symptom can originate from several genes too. 
So it, it gets quite complicated. And then it varies from person to person because each person's uh, genetic and proteomic buildup is different. So, what ha uh, so in that sense, it's useless to think of a disease as, okay, uh, as a cat in a categorized way that this disease has this set of symptoms and that disease has that. What you see is that these symptoms often interact because of the underlying mechanisms that interact with each other. So diseases themselves influence each other. So one disease can cause you to be more, uh, more prone to another. And you see this in, in examples like pe people who study stroke in, in our lab. They have seen that stroke patients are prone to depression and anxiety and some other, uh, other conditions. So, uh, so what happens uh, is that the diseases interact with each other, symptoms interact with each other, and diseases are, from a network perspective, diseases are not well-defined modules, but, uh, but uh, overlaying or interacting systems at this, uh, in, at this stage. So this same principle helps even if you think about it in terms of brain diseases, and we want to now extract that to, to the more neuroscience uh, perspective. And uh, what that means is that just looking, at sim just looking at what they say, the genotype and the phenotype is not enough. You need to understand a little bit more about the computational principles that will tell you a little bit more about what causal mechanisms lead to what. And of course, you're not going to know this at a very detailed level, but you're looking for some invariance or statistics, etc. cetera. So, um, in, in this specific example, what, what people have done, uh, so this, this work was published uh, in 2014 in Nature uh, Communications, and this in very recent, 2015 in Science. So here what you see, uh, uh, let's first say this. Uh, here, here what you see is, uh, after having made this classification of diseases and symptoms, uh, what, what they try to do is, they try, uh, since, di since two different diseases can share symptoms, you can start defining a statistical distance between two diseases. And then you can make a network of various diseases, each node over here is a disease, and its distance to other or interaction to other diseases. And then in addition to just looking at diseases and symptoms, they also use data from, uh, from the protein-protein um, interaction network to try to see that when you, when you have uh, two diseases that are interacting at the level of symptoms, is there also a genetic component over there? So they looked at multiple data sets to create this network. And, and then what they found is that diseases that have similar symptoms seem, seem to be clustered close together at a network level. They are closer together, they, which means they influence each other more. And diseases that are further off are less. So uh, in, in this case, like metabolic uh, meta diseases associated with the metabolic system are close to, cluster close to each other because they influence each other and, and they can perturb each other. Uh, diseases close to some other system are clustered elsewhere. So what you can use is you can try to now, uh, uh, first of all, diseases are interactions at various levels. Symptoms interact, diseases interact. And on top of that, you'll see that if you look at it this way, you can start thinking of drugs in a very different way, which means if a disease is not a modular thing, a drug is also not a specific thing like here, this is drug A, this, drug B, that. It means that your drugs will also be uh, perturbing this network and at the network level what that means. So in the next slide you see that. Uh, here what you see in this particular work, which is this is an interesting project, it's called the Interactome, the, the Interactome project. What, uh, what they, so th may, maybe the word ohm sometimes you know looks like a trend, but uh, if you just ignore all the trendy part and go for the real stuff, the data, this, it can, things can get quite difficult at some point. So what do they do here? In addition to the protein-protein uh, interaction network, they also include all possible molecular interactions at the signaling level, cellular level. So the interactome consists of not only proteins that are expressed by genes, but also higher level, uh, uh, so proteins that interact with each other, either leading to new chemical or metabolic uh, reactions. So uh, so it, it's more than the, the PPI network. and and, and um, this, this specific network has about, um, mm, uh, approximately it has 90,000, uh, more than 90,000 uh, uh, nodes, but they are, even these authors have recognized that the, what they see is just still a part of it, it's probably half of it, it's not even full, and a lot of these interactions are not even known. But yet, what they did observe is, so let's, let's have a look. Uh, so, uh, I mean, of course, it's, it's not that I know every single uh, molecule and what it does there, nor do I expect you to know, but what we are trying to understand here is, if you look at this blue uh, subgraph, these are, uh, these are molecules uh, or proteins uh, that are associated somehow to multiple sclerosis, which means that a mutation or a toxicity or a perturbation or something of that molecule is associated to 
multiple sclerosis, and these, these proteins interact with these other proteins. Okay, so you put up any of them, and that leads to multiple sclerosis, and, and these interact with each other. So th what they found is that, that uh, th th those uh, molecules that lead to a same disease often form a module, a subnetwork, a module in this sense, not in, a, in, the, in the more uh, sort of uh, block, uh, block uh, kind of way of thinking, but in the, as, as a network subgraph. And if you take another disease, you'll have another module. And sometimes these modules are close to each other or they interact with each other, which means that one disease can set off a domino effect to trigger another one if, it is, if the modules are connected to each other somehow via protein interactions or symptom interactions, et cetera. So, uh, and, and also at the same level, uh, a, a, a given perturbation at, for, at one part of this module can trigger off uh, interactions or lack of interactions or dysfunctional interactions on other parts of the module leading to the, this disease. And, and if you see it this way, then you realize why it's not surprising that a given disease will have not only a host of symptoms, but it will work very differently from person to person. Because they are now, as you see, multiple ways it can happen and multiple ways that will interact with each other. So in a way, don't think about this as uh, something causes a disease and then you see the symptoms. Often, the set of symptoms are the collective interactions that give you the disease. And uh, this kind of way of thinking tells you a little bit about that. So, okay, so all, all this is at the level of genomics and proteomics, but the same principles make great sense at the level of neuroscience. Uh, and uh, that's because uh, if we want to look at uh, brain diseases, in some of them we need to look at this level, at others we need to look at other brains, uh, other systems. Uh, which are related to, uh, to the brain, like I discussed. And there again, we will be thinking about uh, disease and cognition this way. Now, whatever I'm saying is for disease, but you can, I mean, if you want to do a hobby project, I, I don't know, maybe for BCBT or later on, you can now start looking at these uh, data sets and start looking at modules of cognition, of cognitive function, and not just for, for at the proteomic level, but even maybe for neuronal data sets. You can start looking for, cog um, for how different cognitive functions might interact or how far away they are from each other, et cetera. So, um, so anyway, in, at this point, all this was only work based on um, curated uh, text mining. The methods were mostly text mining methods, nothing too difficult, but at least they had to care about the statistics and take care of lots, uh, checking null models, et cetera. So they did some, went into great detail for that. Um, what is probably missing over here, um, and which, which is something that is uh, uh, probably a next step, is to now start using what you learn from the data, but not only from the data, but also start using computational models and uh, maybe simulations or principles to aid the way you look at the data. And uh, in this case, it might be hard because, uh, you know, uh, if, if the uh, system is so big, uh, simulating every single gene, is that the best way to do it, uh, et cetera? With the brain, th th you can look at the brain at different levels. We will mostly be looking at, uh, at it at the macro and meso level. So in, in fact, I'll never be looking at single neurons. It's another question what you can learn from that. I'm not saying you don't need it. But for large scale brain diseases, the macro, uh, the macro or meso level will be a little bit more important. And then we try to, uh, given the data, we try to develop models uh, to understand what you can't see in the data by doing the modeling. The modeling tells you something that you cannot directly see otherwise, but based on what, you, what principles you have learned or what you have observed. So uh, just to close this whole uh, discussion with the network medicine part, um, once, so the red nodes here are different diseases. Now what you can do is, once you know that diseases somehow interact or are associated to each other, you can start asking what happens if you put together or build a network of diseases and drugs, all possible diseases, all possible drugs. This is not all possible, this is just a subset. But the, the real data set would be much bigger and many more missing things. But if you start building a network, a two-layered network, drugs on one hand and diseases on one hand, what you see is, the, the way they look at it is like this. Uh, in, in this case, let, let's say you have, uh, you have two diseases. So you have one year, one year, okay? Uh, at the moment, they're not trying to connect anything directly at the disease level. But both these diseases might be influenced by a given drug. And this drug might influence several other diseases too. So now you have a drug that influences this one and this one and maybe something else. And then this disease is influenced by another drug and that one yet by another. So now you have 
what you see is that perturb making perturbations at the level of the drugs, you're probably affecting several different diseases on top. I, and so it's not that a specific drug will only affect a specific disease. And this way, what people have begun to realize is that, uh, so le let me see if I can uh, show you, uh, no. Uh, let's see. So uh, for, for, for instance, you, you might have heard the, these things where uh, um, you know that um, sometimes you read it in, in p uh, science papers or news or et cetera, that um, some, um, the, at the onset of Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's, you have different other diseases that sometimes might be predicative of that. So you might have dementia, which happens before Alzheimer's. And here what you see is indeed, uh, if, 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 you, if you see the, the, the drug disease interactions, the drugs that you give for dementia, uh, they have some relation to Alzheimer's too, because Alzheimer's and de dementia share some share some commonalities, not just at the level of symptoms, but at the level of some mechanisms, and one really causes the other in terms of the modules you saw before, but also at the level of drugs, one, one thing will interact with the other, and, and this way you might, in this system, you might be able to discover drugs that usually you thought were for one specific disease, but due to these network interactions, they actually influence yet another disease. And, in, and people have begun to realize this. This is a hard problem. Um, and it's not easy because you, know, you cannot take a risk with humans all the time. Uh, you sometimes do these things on animals. But uh, these methods start giving you hints of how to look at uh, medicine in a more interactive si uh, systems uh, approach. Uh, similar, uh, similar, you know, uh, similarly, um, uh, for example, cardiovascular diseases like stroke are often, um, uh, sorry, cerebrovascular diseases like stroke are associated to cardiovascular diseases like heart attack, et cetera. Uh, your, your propensity to, uh, to get a arterial block might actually uh, give you a greater chance of getting a stroke. In, that, in this case, the mechanism is obvious. Uh, I mean, if, if you have some blockage in the, uh, in the coronal art artery, the chance of that uh, clot traveling to the brain and blocking something, giving a stroke is greater. So that you see it more obviously, but now also at the level of drugs, the drugs that influence uh, your heart disease might actually have some some effect on how it ha how things work on the at the brain level so uh, th this is the this is the kind of uh, approach that network medicine takes uh, and uh, this is you know the, these these are still things in progress so this was for drugs but in this talk we are not going to look so much at drugs what happens this way for drugs also happens for other therapies. And we are more interested in neuroprosthetic therapies, control, theoretic uh, uh, approaches, rehabilitation, et cetera. And there also this approach of these interactions and uh, makes sense. So in order to approach the problem, you don't just randomly do things. You try to build a principled way of where to put up the network. I mean, normally you go, you know, nowadays all these fancy brain simulation techniques, just put an electrode somewhere. I mean, it's good, but, uh, it can be, it can do good thing or bad thing, right? You put an electrode at the wrong place, it'll trigger the wrong kinds of symptoms that you don't want. You have to think of how to do it, and this this can be done if you think about this at the systems level with, in, with a more theoretic way of uh, thinking. So, what's our approach? Our approach is to think of the brain uh, at at a multi level uh, in a multi level way. We have built some tools to do that because, as I said, much of these data sets are so huge that you start using clusters and other things. So. Uh, what you see on the right hand side is the XIM. I suggest uh, since you are in Barcelona, one of the things you should see before going is the brain X cube in the XIM. Uh, uh, some, someone can organize a demonstration one of the days. The virtual reality lab is just in the other building uh, next to Paul's office. So, uh, so what, what we have built over here uh, is a system for visualization, uh, interaction, simulation and uh, analysis of large data sets. Uh, I mean, so in this case, uh, what we can do is we, we, first, uh, we, we, we first build a, a 3D reconstruction of the brain network here. And uh, in fact, this person, this is not even a fake, uh, fake guy. This is Alberto, one of the co-authors. Uh, in this specific case, uh, he's interacting with the, with the network. So there's a connect somewhere. There are some sensors. And you can make natural gestures and try to uh, either re-represent the way the network is. Because we have data of the positions as well as the connectivity. So you can represent it in different ways. And you can visualize it. But well, visualization is just fancy. You want to do something more serious. Uh, so there, at, at that stage, what we can do is we can start do, uh, you know, doing some simulation models. So now in this case, 
uh, you don't do single neuron simulations, but you do population simulations because what you have in the data set are not single neurons, but they are populations of neurons connected by fiber tracks to other populations of neurons. So looking at population models, we can do those type of simulations and look at large scale brain activity across the cortex. And we can do this in health and in disease. And in this case, we'll do it for stroke uh, in, a, in a second, you'll see. So the approach that we take is, we, we think about this whole problem in three layers. The connectomics is more or less what I said now about looking at the brain dynamics and the brain simulations. But then we also want to understand how what you do at the simulation level leads to symptoms. What type of behavior does it lead to? And this is a difficult problem. Uh, in the previous study, you saw that from the genes, they are trying to go to symptoms, which means to some behavioral effects, et cetera. Here, we want to go from the simulations to the symptoms. And for that, we have tried to, uh, again, use a text mining approach to, to build a layer of symptoms. And uh, uh, you'll see this uh, quickly coming up, where we try to take data from the literature on brain uh, regions and try to now, so let's say you do a brain simulation and you see some pattern, but what? What does that mean? I mean, if you have a given pattern, you can pass it through some machine learning filter, et cetera, you get some numbers. But you want to know what it means, uh, what behaviorally, cognitively, what functions it, it leads to. Uh, and, and that kind of thing we can do by text mining methods uh, to some extent. And, and I show you how far we have gotten with that. Uh, some of that work is published in uh, Procedia Computer Science. Uh, previous stuff was published in Frontiers uh, Neuroinformatics. And um, so, so, so what, what do we do? What, what, one, is, uh, one is that we can generate, uh, g given data, we can generate large scale simulations of the rest of the brain activity, which you don't see in the data. You can start now mapping that to behavioral symptoms in some cases. And what you then want to do is, you want to design therapies, what we call cues, which means in this case, we just call it cues, meaning anything that in is influenced by the environment, but it can be it's mostly not just natural causes, also rehabilitation intended intended environment, let's say. Uh, so so all, all your rehabilitation will influence some part of the brain. So instead of, instead of making a, a guinea pig out of a human being, you can now, in this simulation, start uh, using these perturbations. So if you have uh, uh, this type of uh, transcranial uh, electric uh, stimulation or uh, TMS, et cetera, you can start applying this kind of uh, perturbations at the level of the connectome network. See how these perturbations change the dynamics and correspondingly see what new symptoms they map to. So you can start seeing how your perturbations uh, or how your therapies will what it lead to, does it make the person better or worse? And you can start making a scoring system and assessing symptoms. So this way, you, this is like a virtual therapy. You can also do virtual neurosurgery if you like. And, and, and this is not just science fiction. Uh, th this is important for, for one very specific reason that which you'll see in the language network, where you need to do a pre-surgical uh, simulation of what's going to ha what's the what's the result of a given surgery. Like you cut off some part because there's a tumor or epilepsy. What does it lead to? Like you might think that, okay, I solved the main problem, but you probably created some more. And you know, in the history of medicine, there are lots of these dark examples. Um, so in this case, you can actually um, start studying that systematically before performing it on, on a person. And then there are, of course, environmental factors that might influence uh, the, uh, the higher levels. Uh, also remember that here also, all the drugs and everything comes at this level. So these drugs, uh, in, so, of course, in reality, you can ask that, of course, this is a schema, but this schema can be more detailed. Drugs will also influence the proteins, and proteins, in turn, will influence the, the, the neuronal level. So, in what sense? So, what happens is that when you give a drug, a drug usually targets some receptors in, uh, at the cellular level, or sometimes at the, uh, at the actual neuronal level, too. And those receptors will start changing the, 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 the chemical interaction. So let's, let's take a simple example. If you have neurons and you have, um, if you target dopamine receptors, you will start changing the, the dopamine neuromodulation in a given local region. So now I'm not talking about a single neuron. I'm talking about uh, the, the, whole, the whole chemical influencing a given part. So th this is like uh, the, the drug will influence a part. part uh, you can take alcohol. That's another great example. But we won't talk about that now. So. Uh, in, in, in that case, what happens is that these, these you can build um, compartment models to understand how these chemicals, uh, with some approximations, influence parts of the brain region. And 
and then in your neuronal model you can make change those parameters where those chemicals have influenced to see how the effects happen later so in a second you see how that works uh, so here again this is the brain network we are working with the same data set as i showed but now represented in terms of nodes and edges uh, uh, this is 1000 nodes with 15,000 uh, bidirectional connections. Uh, these fibers are weighted, but the data is highly incomplete. It is known that many connections are missing. It is also known that uh, this method, uh, th so this is not fMRI, this is obtained by uh, DSI, DTI, DSI plus tractography. Uh, I mean, given that we had nothing before that, it's a great method, but it still is missing directionality. It's different from your bold uh, data sets. But um, we, need, we need better tools uh, and they, much progress is happening to, to improve what we can, the quality of what we can uh, measure. So uh, each node is a voxel around 1.5 milli, uh, cubic uh, millimeter, uh, cubic millimeter. So, so that, 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 that voxel of a tissue co contains about thousands of neurons. And what we do is we want to model the interactions between these voxels. So, so now look at, if you look at this specific model, this is a given population of neurons. This is another given population of neurons. This is one voxel, this is another voxel. This is just a simplified example. So then you see how this neuronal population influences this other neuronal population. Now, originally, these models were discovered years ago um, in, when people were doing monkey studies in, in decision making and other physiological experiments, where they wanted to see how some small part of, uh, of, of the monkey's uh, uh, cortex uh, influenced some ta decision task, etc. So, th so what they did is they took, they took uh, for a single neuron, you, you, have, you have lots of good models, you know, inti integrate, fire, Hodgkin, Huxley, et cetera. But what happens is when you make a population of, uh, when you try to take many neurons together in a simulation or in an in a actual computation, you see that the behavior of the mass uh, is, is, some, is some sort of mean field behavior and with some corrections, et cetera. So you can build uh, uh, coarse grain models from single neuron models. And as I told you before, um, the, o often uh, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. So sometimes you might see more interesting or new effects that you didn't expect before. Uh, and, and, and then in this way you build these neuronal firing models and then you just work at that level and connect it to each other. So in this case, I don't have to model every single neuron. I just model populations of neurons. And in this case, there are 1,000 populations. So this is not something very heavy. You can do it on your laptop. Uh, but if you had to model 1 million neurons, then you maybe wouldn't be able to do it on your laptop. And um, in fact, you don't really need to model 1 million neurons, but maybe given the, uh, it might be good to model 1 million populations of neurons, because in reality, there are 86 billion neurons in, on an average in the human brain. You're not going to just model every single neuron. And even if you did, without any principle, it might not teach you much. Or you'll see just a mess, but I'm not saying it's useless, but you need to know how to look at it. So, um, so, so anyway, in, in, in this case, we work with population models. And now, what can you do uh, with these kind of things? This is the healthy connectome. So you can look at healthy resting state activity. You can also put perturbations at specific areas like the visual area or the frontal area or some motor cortex and look at activity during task. In this case, task means perturbations to those areas because if it's a visual thing, it, there'll be signals from the eyes, the retina going to the visual areas, et cetera. Uh, it is true that there's much to be improved in this. This is, this is hardly a complete piece of work. This is, I would say, just work in progress. Uh, it, it's still missing um, um, subcortical modeling. Uh, su not every subcortical uh, region is important, but depending on what effect you're studying, you might need like corticothalamic interactions, corticocerebellar or something like that. For memory, you might need hippocampus. Uh, but now it's more and more becoming, uh, you know, it's getting realized that you need to study interactions of large scale brain regions to study many of these cognitive effects. So uh, in, in, in this case, uh, we, uh, let, let's not worry about the equations right now. I, I'll just say that with these models, uh, they are nonlinear. You can start studying resting state, uh, resting state activity of the brain. And often you hear this terminology of attractors. So, so what happens is it, these models are dynamical systems model. Dynamical systems usually settle into some attractor. And that attractor is often associated to some behavior. So, you, so your healthy resting state, when you apparently close your eyes and try to do nothing, uh, which is quite an active state, because you fail at doing nothing, uh, th that leads to some 
some attractor in this language. And if you have a task, it's a perturbation to another attractor state. And then, and what about disease? So, so for disease, what you'll do is take stroke. In stroke, what you'll do is, uh, I mean, the way we look at stroke is this way. Uh, independent to this data set, uh, this is average human data. Independent to this, for stroke, uh, we, uh, we, we have uh, from the hospital, you have, uh, you have uh, structural MRI, structural brain scans, which are just volumetric images of the brain. And when there's a lesion somewhere, you see a big black hole there or somewhere else. So in, in these scans, you can try to locate the position of the lesion and then map that position of the lesion to the connectome network here and severe those connections corresponding to that stroke. And then rerun the simulations and you of course see a totally new pattern of activity in this lesion network compared to the unlesioned network. And then you can start mapping, uh, asking questions like, well, in this new dynamics, what are the behavioral effects that will be different or what deficiencies of uh, what functions will be missing, et cetera. Um, Sure, you can say, well, you, lots is missing in the problem, but this is at least the start of uh, how you can start looking at diseases. Similarly, for other diseases that are connectivity dis diseases, you can start looking at um, uh, may maybe there's a volumetric uh, thinning of the uh, some part of the tissue and some fibers are not as strong, uh, 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 white matter fibers are not as strongly connected or there's some, in, in multiple sclerosis, you know that my, the myelin sheets are often damaged of exo long, long uh, distance axons. So multiple sclerosis manifests itself as diffuse lesions all over. Stroke manifests itself as a big focal lesion. So this way, you, uh, we have also tried multiple sclerosis models, but we have not really used the underlying mechanism of multiple sclerosis. The, the, what leads to multiple sclerosis and what leads to stroke is totally different. But at the symptom level, they both give you lesions, and those lesions affect much of your behavioral uh, 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 aspects. So OK, so uh, that, that's what you do with, with diseases. This is the same data set, so let's run out of that. Uh, here, uh, this is not, nothing new. It's the same thing that I mentioned. Uh, we try to uh, run simulations of resting state activity. Uh, now, these models have several parameters. Uh, as you know, the problem with modeling is models are never Models are never complete. Models always have three parameters, and you're trying to fit parameters. And the way you fit it today, as opposed to five years later, might actually change things because of new information you got later. And um, in a way, you know, uh, when you work with data, this is a problem. Um, it's always easy to fit data. You know, data fitting can always be done. But the more informed you are about, um, let's say, the underlying mechanisms or principles, perhaps what you see will in your fitting will be closer to the actual mechanisms so uh, so here we have uh, we have noise uh, we have noise in the model we have a global coupling uh, and we have some inputs the global coupling is a free parameter so we had to adjust that based on other types of data set and uh, uh, of course we in this case we didn't just uh, do random fitting we looked at the, the literature all along in in lots of uh, lots of earlier studies to see what were the reasonable operating points of uh, activity. So, I mean, you can check, for instance, uh, the, the, the firing activity. In, uh, this is these are just different views: the top view, the back, and the lateral views. Um, if, if you look at the actual, uh, so the simulations give you the actual firing. Uh, steady, st this is the resting state firing act activity at a given node, etc. You can see the frequency of uh, in hertz of uh, of the firing activity and. Given all the past literature and what you know, you can compare whether your model has produced something that's reasonable in those ranges. So, in so looking at these physical effects, you can start fitting things. Uh, in this case, what we do is um, we fit the parameters for the resting state. So that's not a prediction; that's really a fit. But once the parameters are fit at this level, we use those parameters to make predictions about other situations where now we are not fitting anything. Like once everything is fit, looking at uh, looking at the fact that you have produced reasonable resting state activity, then once you start performing lesions or uh, or things like that, the predictions you get for stroke, etc., are now predictions of the simulation. So uh, in in this case, you can also play with other parameters uh, besides the global coupling and the inputs. The inputs would the inputs to different brain regions would correspond to task versus no task, etc. Uh, the, noi the noise noise has an interesting interpretation. People don't know what is noise in the brain. Uh, there has been some recent work that noise might be associated to aging, which means in aged brains, uh, at the molecular level, uh, the receptors become a little bit less robust and start uh, start creating errors in in the uh, in the in the way molecules are transferred, etc., or their response time latencies, uh, things like that. And that leads to what you look 
look at at the neuronal level as noise. So noise is an interesting thing, and in these type of models we played with noise, but not at the level of the molecular mechanisms, just at the top level of changing noise uh, and seeing. So I mean, if, of course, if you increase noise, the system becomes more noisy. But at, because the, remember, this is a nonlinear system. So in a nonlinear system, you have multiple attractors. So noise can do more fun things which means it won't just make it noisy, it can also push you from one attractor to a totally different attractor. And here, what, that's kind of what we observed, that when you increase the noise a lot, uh, at some point there's a transition to another attractor, and in this case, it's this attractor, this was the healthy attractor, this could be the brain dead attractor. So here it, it kind of suppressed most of the activity, so just increasing noise a lot gave you a dead brain. And uh, that can be, interesting to think more seriously about um, as a future uh, piece of work uh, what the effect if noise and aging are related um, in that sense noise might be a consequence of aging and it tells you what the pre uh, what the consequence symptoms might be during aging and then you might want to look at uh, what might be the molecular mechanisms to control those symptoms etc so uh, simulations give you those type of insights which which are not the complete answer to the problem but now given that you can look at the data much more uh, with with a better hypothesis and you can tr start following up uh, to understand the problem better. Uh, similarly, yeah, we, you don't need this, we just did some analysis. Uh, this is simulation of the stroke network, as I said, the same thing, but now creating a lesion, and then you observe stroke activity. Uh, so in this case, well, what we did was, the, the, the simple thing, uh, the first thing to do was that once you have a, the healthy connectome and the stroke connectome, you can compare the difference to see how much is the difference of activity. Uh, you can do better types of analysis. Uh, you can do more specific types of analysis. You can see what frequencies are missing, etc. You can do much more. But just as a first simple case, we just compared the absolute difference of per node activity between healthy and uh, stroke. And what, uh, and the gray, let, let's just look at the left hand side. The gray, uh, the gray bars are the, play, no, so on the x-axis you have the number or uh, the labels of all the nodes. Uh, this is the difference in firing activity on the y-axis. The gray regions denote the, the nodes that are lesioned. So of course the nodes where they are lesioned, the difference in activity is extremely high. So that's not important. But what you see is uh, the other nodes which are not lesioned, uh, whenever there is a red activity, which means there's a difference between health and stroke, you see that those no the the dynamics of uh, of neur neural activity in those brain areas is affected because of a stroke here. A stroke here affects other regions. It it works as a network. Uh, but what's more interesting is in this example, wh what you see is this is for one level of noise. This is for a higher level of noise, higher level of noise, and extremely high level of noise. The four levels of noise. So at the lowest level of noise, uh, you see the effect on other regions is, so to say, not too much but something, as you increase the noise, the influence on other regions, it keeps increasing, which means that uh, greater noise makes the rest of the network less robust to the perturbation that stroke caused at that given region. So, well, I mean, this is one in small insight, and like this, you can start looking at it from a systems point of view, you, you start realizing these things. Uh, now, of course, if you have this, this kind of stuff, you can ask like, okay, as a, as a person who wants to do rehabilitation, what you do in stroke is, let's say this area is affected. You pro except, that, except if you de develop a new biomedical therapy to regrow that area, which you can actually, uh, and I'll mention, remind me to say that, or ask a question if I run out of time later. Uh, that, that's one thing, but the other thing you might do for rehabilitation is, you might ask, all right, forget about this, let me see if there are ways in which I can train the brain to reorganize or rewire to take on this activity by some other regions, which means these other, uh, the, the rest of the network, can you somehow re rewire it or train its plasticity, et cetera, or can you somehow put uh, these TMS or, or uh, transcranial uh, uh, um, um, uh, currents into some areas to control these other differences? So for, for instance, if, if the stroke didn't influence any other part of the network, Except for except for the gray bar, the rest of the acti activity difference should be zero. So so the so so to say the control problem would be what kind of perturbations can I put for the rest of the network such that all these differences vanish, which means that at least there is close to normal activity in other areas. So um, now this question is this question really goes into the realm of control theory, and we'll try to see how to address this problem um, formally. We, we 
definitely needs some, some good mathematical approach for that, and control theory has a lot of tools. So we'll use that in, as we proceed. Uh, so how am I doing with time, actually? I uh, totally. Really? Yeah. Oh. How long do you need? This was half. One hour. No. I can cut short a few things, but this was actually half of the slides. Uh, you want me to continue after lunch? Tomorrow might be difficult because I have to chair. I can. What time? Um, 11, t uh, 10.30 to 12.30. I can be there in tomorrow afternoon, not in the morning. OK, let's see. I, I'll probably have to cut short some things. But anyway, um, you know, you, so, so far you've got some uh, ideas of what's going on here. I might have to skip a few details. Uh, and we can always, you're here for two weeks. You can, you can talk about things later. So um, all right. So, here, here what you see is, uh, so I, I told you much about what we do with our connectomics and also with our semantomics. The semantomics was the text mining part. Uh, at the moment, let's uh, forget about the, the technical part of how we set up the text mining tool. Uh, let's go to what it does rather than how we did it because it doesn't matter. You can do it another way too. Let's see what it does and if that is useful or something else should be done. So uh, given brain activity, what do you want to see? The first thing you might want to see is, you want to see if some brain regions are active or some are not, uh, what functions they are associated to. So in this case, you can click on a specific active brain region or an inactive brain region, and the, the text tool will tell you all about that brain region, which means it'll look through all the literature that is curated and tell you all the diseases, functions, uh, history, etc. what's there. Now, this is not the internet of brain, okay? It's just curated database because uh, uh, we wanted to control the, the type of information we have. So this is one thing, but this is, well, this is easy. Uh, let's see the more interesting thing. The more interesting thing would be to start building a, a network of, of symptoms or semantomics, uh, as, as you saw in that three-layer approach. So now what you can do is, let's say that you have a stroke in this region. Now, and in, 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 the, in the semantic layer, we are, in addition to text mining, we also have a search engine function built, uh, built over here. So what you can do is, you, you might want to know what are the symptoms that are associated to this specific type of overall brain activity. So over here, you might query some, uh, some uh, uh, list of symptoms that probably are associated or you have a good guess about it, or the system can just search it directly. And what the uh, system will do is, it will combine the simulation with the text in the following way. It will search through the entire text for this specific symptom, like visual neglect, see which brain areas it's associated to, and map that symptom to the specific brain regions that are important for that symptom in the text database. But that's just anatomical mapping. But what you have here is, in addition to the mapping, you have the dynamics. So when a given symptom maps to a given region, the dynamics also tells you whether that region is active or not active. Uh, which means whether it, uh, compared to its normal state. So, uh, so in your stroke, uh, in your uh, for stroke, I showed you that you can start looking at differences between stroke and health, and you identify some brain areas where there is a prominent difference. Uh, so, what happens is that uh, in 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 this case, you can start looking if those regions, uh, what, uh, those areas that are prominently different between stroke and health, uh, in the semantic database, what symptoms does it map to? So then, then probably that means that those functions that were associated to that area whose activity has now totally changed might have a different way of functioning. Similarly, uh, if a given symptom maps to, let's say, this specific brain region, and this brain region is off, then it means that this symptom uh, or, or this function, if it was a function, uh, is now off, or this symptom is on. So whether symptoms can be on or off, require not just knowledge of the structure to which they are related, but also according to the activity, which you can see from the dynamics. So by combining structure and function, you see when a symptom is on off, and you can start making on off um, uh, in time, you can start building on and off states of symptoms, and then try to see how, uh, what happens in a disease is often that there are a group of symptoms that are on at a given time, then as you do some intervention, 
what is on and what is off changes and you see another set that can be on or off and and these uh, since these brain regions interact with each other so if this brain region as a whole is interacting somehow or connected somehow uh, dynamically to the other one obviously these symptoms will interact with each other too so in this kind of work we see why symptoms actually should never be seen in iso as isolated modules but as units that can be a sequence of interactions from one to the other and in the same way, if you now start putting perturbations and put thera uh, for therapeutic perturbations, you will see how those perturbations will change this chain of symptom interactions. Um, so so, so that, that's the kind of approach we take with this uh, structure. Uh, with brain tumor, what, what I will uh, do to keep things uh, short is, um, so uh, the, 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 the main message here is uh, you, uh, we, we looked at TMS data from, uh, from, uh, from uh, these papers. These are actually surgeons doing uh, medical experiments. What you do is, uh, if, if you, so the language areas of the brain are on the left-hand side, of, uh, left -hand side uh, in, if, if that's your dominant uh, hemisphere. Um, and um, if you have, a, in this case, we looked at patients who had glioma, which is a localized brain tumor in the left hemisphere, perhaps close to the language area, if not exactly in. And when you have to, when a surgeon has to remove those things before removing, they have to be a little careful to see which other areas might actually interact with the language areas. And in your surgical procedure, you don't touch that so that you don't affect language. Now, what, what they realize is over time that language is not localized to a given area, but lots of other regions can influence your language capabilities, even outside the classical language area, because the language thing is a network. So what you have in healthy subjects is that a, a red area means it's extremely important for language. A, a lighter area means it's not so important for language. Uh, in the right-hand side, you don't have much, uh, much of uh, language areas. They're mostly on the left-hand side. But in brain tumor patients, what they found is that the language network is completely different. You have lots, since in this case, because the tumor was on the left-hand side, language functions got taken over or in, in some part by the right hand side as well. So the language network completely reorganized. But this reorganization doesn't mean that, uh, does it, uh, my, my, this reorganization doesn't mean that completely all the connections change. You usually have local connections that change, but long, at the long distance, you don't necessarily, uh, it doesn't mean that totally new neurons grow. That doesn't happen so fast. What happens is that the dynamical organization changes and where signals propagate uh, or what circuits are important for language now can change. Because in this network, you can have multiple ways of reaching from point A to point B or you can have multiple mechanisms of going from one activity to another in order to create some function. So the reorganization of the language network uh, signifies that a lot is changing at the level of the dynamics. And uh, what we did in short over here uh, is to show, uh, so in, in this TMS data, you just see externally what these language areas are. But from the connectomics, combining this data with the connectomics, we are able to map exactly which these, uh, which these, uh, which parts are part of the language network. So, in, in healthy subjects, you see most of the network. Now, now we have actually mapped the network, which you didn't know from the TMS data before. Uh, in healthy subjects, it's mostly on the left hand side, but in brain tumor patients, the network strong has a strong component on both the sides. Now. Um, you can, uh, we, we, did, uh, we did some more network measures here. I won't go into the details, but the take home message uh, or, or the take home insight was the following. Think about it this way. What are the major language areas? In this case, Broca's, Wernicke's. Where are they? On the left hand side, okay? Uh, only on the left hand side. So you have the same uh, anatomical region on both sides, but what is called the Broca's area or what dominantly works for language is on the left hand side. So here, what happened was, uh, in when we analyze this network using network theory measures from network science, what we realize is that all the areas of the language network, whether in healthy or tumor patients, all the areas in this network are all strongly connected to the classical broca wernicke's area. Which means that even though the network itself has reorganized and is completely different, it is still strongly connected to the classical areas. It's just that now it's different connections from the classical areas despite the fact that the classical areas are on the left hand side and now these are on the right hand side. So the classical areas in terms of network theory terms are what you could call as in between centrality. They are, they are central to the network. I, I, uh, I mean, you can think about it as hubs, but really the right measure is to check in between the centrality. So, uh, so this way, uh, what it means is for future, uh, 
if you are performing a surgery or you are looking for reorganization of some function because of this or any other disease, what you might try to look at is if you, ident if you know, which you, which you already do, what the classical areas are for that function, uh, looking at all the, uh, looking at that area as the central area for the given connectome network, you identify the subnetwork based on on the centrality of those regions, and that might be the subnetwork where possible reorganization might occur. And this you might be able to tell before doing any uh, uh, procedure like an uh, invasive uh, technique to find out whether this person the area is affected or before a surgery. So now using this principle that the classical areas might be the ones that are central, you can actually start looking at what are the possible ways the brain could reorganize. And that you wouldn't know unless you combine these types of data. And plus here we only looked at it at the structural level. Now if you put dynamics, you might get more informative on that. So, so that, that was another example where we uh, worked on these things. Uh, we can skip this. Uh, what I can do is, um, now there are two paths to this, but probably I cut one of them. Uh, giving, so, so far what you saw was mostly uh, reconstruction of data, combining different types of data into a sensible uh, way that you can build some hypothesis, simulations of computational or mechanistic principles, etc. The next thing will be given uh, network theory, you can start, um, you can start doing uh, analysis that uses principles from dynamical systems theory, uh, and control theory and information theory. Um, information theory is great, uh, you already saw why, but uh, in one word, what it would do is, if you have multiple types of signals that are interacting, information doesn't care about what is the content of the signal, it just cares how much is exchanged. Uh, and, and in a way, when you have different types of uh, entities, information tells you something about global properties. In this case, what you want to know is how much is the whole greater than the, uh, than the parts or how much is the overall information processing and why, why this might be important. So in, in recent years, pe people who have been studying consciousness. Now let's look at consciousness as a biological phenomena. Forget about all the philosophy. Look at it in more biologically and more clinically. What are the disorders of consciousness? You have coma, vegetative state, and then the best uh, is your, your current <coughs> aware state if, if it's not the sleep one. So uh, you can actually start asking questions like these different levels of consciousness, are they associated to different levels of global information processing? And this global thing will be because there has been some uh, issues or problems at the structural level or at the dynamics. And using these information theoretic complexity measures, what we found was a way to go beyond graph theory and combine structure with dynamics to, to say how much information is being processed in given states. So in that sense, network theory is much more than graph theory. Graph is only about structure. Network combines structure with function, with dynamics. And then it can tell you global measures, uh, or in this case of information processing or of control. Um, with information processing, you might heard about, you might have heard about this measure uh, called integrated information by Tononi. Uh, maybe this is not the time to go into details of what this measure is, but we are, but feel free to discuss these things uh, over the time. We, we are all happy to talk over here. Uh, so, what the main point I will say is that using this measure uh, in a very mathematical way. Uh, it, it, so let's, let's take a simple example. Let's take an artificial network, this is a structure, um, and each node has some dynamics, okay? And, here I'm, and in this case, the dynamics is some, that this system generates some time series data. So this would be the time series signals uh, generated by this system. So here I've just done a simulation, and now you want to ask, uh, for sure you can ask locally what happens between this and this, or blah, blah, blah. But what we want to know is, at a global level, how much information is being processed. So let's say this system makes, uh, you want to look at it in time, so time step, time step one, two, three, four. So as it transitions from one time point to another, some amount of information processing is going, and what you want to know is that if you had broken this whole thing into its parts, compared to putting it together, how much is the difference in information? And that's of course because of all the complex interactions. So this measure can be uh, uh, qu uh, quantified, uh, but we, we won't go into the theory now. I just want to tell you that the phi, which will be the measure to quantify that, it will be denoted by phi. We won't run into equations, you can uh, look into published work later. Uh, this measure, uh, we can compute it. Um, so in, the, in this case, in this case what, what is important is, you know, uh, in, in a lot of problems like this, when you're still, when you're still trying to understand the theory, 
it, it is, it is, uh, it's a good idea not to directly do MATLAB or numerics, but to first try to compute things exactly and analytically, understand at the physical level or at the level of physics or dynamical systems what it means, and maybe then use it for some more complex, larger data, and then do numerics. Because in numerics, you'll probably see artifacts which you might not be able to identify a priori without some principled understanding whether those are effects or or just artifacts. So uh, in in these type of sample networks, uh, this measure that you saw, we have a we have a we have a well formulated mathematical theory. Uh, you can compute it exactly as a function of couplings. By exactly, I mean something like this. But it's, it's very easy, but it looks like that. But Forget the uh, things, let's see the results. Here what I have is phi as a function of the coupling. This, the coupling is the strength of the weights. Now what you see over here is uh, for, for those various networks, so what you see is uh, these are networks with different topologies from the most densely packed to the least. You can take any, any one example. So what you see over here uh, uh, is that you can compute the complexity of each of these networks as a function of this coupling parameter. Now, what happens is that its complexity uh, or its information processing capacity depends on both structure and function. If you only look at graph theory, you might be able to define something based purely on structure. But this measure computes both structure and function, which means that this specific network might have a, if its, if its functional point or its dynamical operating point is this coupling, it will have go, go to extremely high information processing or complexity at this point, but not at some other point. And the same, another network with a totally different structure can give you maybe comparable levels of information processing, but at a different operating point. So in a way, structure and uh, dynamics are two dimensions. You can't ignore them, and they are independent. So, uh, so what, what, and the, the, one, of the, uh, one of the insights we got in this type of analysis was that the closer, uh, so the, the point is that in all these figures, you see there's a, it goes very high and there's a drop, drop, drop. This drop happens to be the point where the network becomes critical and then becomes unstable. So after after the point that it's unstable, you don't have any uh, you don't have any uh, value for this measure. Uh, uh, but close to the critical point, the complexity is very high, or how much it integrates, in, how much information integrates as a whole greater than the path is very high. What does that mean for the brain? So for the brain, we did the same thing. We took the brain network. This is the original connectome network. Here's just a randomized version of the same network to compare what the random network would do to the original. And we saw exactly the same type of qualitative feature, uh, of course, with different values. So the, the original brain, uh, uh, brain uh, th in this case, it's not only the network. We also put in dynamics in there. But here we took simplified dynamics. And um, you see the same feature. But what's interesting is that the organization of the brain leads to greater values of, uh, of complexity or uh, or information processing at every coupling strand compared to the random network. And at some point, it becomes critical and goes very high. So then you can ask, OK, fine. At the level of information and complexity, this, this is what structure and dynamics does. But where is the brain sitting? What is the value of G for the brain so that you know exactly what is the complexity of the healthy brain and how you can maybe compare this to stroke, disease, et cetera. So for that, we just looked a bit into the literature. And what we, uh, what we uh, found was um, um, in independent work done by people who do brain modeling, et cetera, uh, in, in also in, in a more, with, with much more complex dynamics than we put here, what they realize is that the dynamical operating point of the human brain is very close to criticality. It is not at criticality, but at the edge of criticality, in that case, the edge of a bifurcation. And here, what we see is, from the stuff we realize here, we might be able to answer that question, why is it sitting at that point? In the modeling, you see, by, uh, in all that work, that it's sitting close there, but it doesn't say why. So here, the answer, the why, is in the following way. Close to critical point, the, uh, the, net, the information processing capacity of the network is very high. So it is informationally very beneficial or optimal for the system to be operating close to that point as opposed to far. And that's why the brain might be sitting there. So that's just one small insight. And then they, they, you might go into other details about uh, at the dynamical systems level, what's happening here. You might look into its spectral analysis, et cetera. But that's another topic. Uh, now, looking at these information measures, you can uh, get some insights about uh, the, he the healthy brain, you can compare it to a disease, et cetera. And for consciousness, this is very important because people want to compare uh, brains of pa uh, pa patients of 
with dis disorders of consciousness versus healthy states and try to use that for real medical assessment. Nowadays, it's not easy to just put a person in an fMRI scanner and determine the level of consciousness. And this is important for several medical uh, reasons, including deciding whether this person is dead or not. Uh, and so you need better ways than the old way of just, you know, shaking up and seeing what happens. You can't just depend on external behavior. So, so here there are better ways to do that. And um, uh, okay, those are the applications I already mentioned. That brings me to the last point. Um, this would take 15 minutes. Okay. block right of, of analysis that builds on the previous one because we go towards control and closing the loop and things like this no am i right yeah so this afternoon is a we can put it in the tutorial slot this afternoon okay, okay? do this one after lunch is that good okay. cool. all right so, so would you like to conclude on the parts that you have been you have been discussing so far Oh, I didn't plan that. <laughs> <laughs> there okay, you go. okay, okay. So, 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 so the me the message so far is uh, to 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 uh, to, stu to study brain disorders and disease. Uh, the approach that we take is we we first look at what the data tells us. We try to do uh, look at computational principles or mechanistic models that can that can tell us how, how to combine structure with dynamics. You see, I mean, the, the, the usual kind of uh, trendy way to talk in neuroscience is hey, structure and function. Function is fMRI data, and structure is whatever structural data. fMRI data is not function. It's not. It's, it's a very loose correlate of function. To really understand function, you need to look at dynamics, local dynamics, and how that leads to, leads to some behavioral uh, effects. fMRI data sets are useful in when you use it in combination with other things. But you can't just make conclusions by looking at fMRI activity directly. So the message is uh, to look at mechanistic circuits of the brain, to look at uh, neuromodulators, uh, to look at it from a system's point of view if you're interested in a specific disease, look at what other components of your, your, your body, your nervous system, your vasculature, your proteins, your genes might be relevant for that specific disease. Not everything might, but whatever is. And look at it from a system's point of view. Once you do that, you can uh, use global analysis methods like information theory and other things. But in the end, you can also, if you think about the brain as a multi-level system, uh, and in terms of a multi-level system, you think of therapy and perturbations at one level and symptoms at the top level and the biology in between, then you can start designing engineered strategies using principles from control theory to drive the system from one behavior to another. So that, that would be the conclusion for this part. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. So since we're done the second part in the afternoon, we can have the, the, the broader uh, questions then. But are there any urgent uh, questions that, that came up up to this point? Right, so in some sense, okay, so Wait, the one that was urgent is not urgent. <laughs> then we Let's see, but what did you, what did you draw? Uh, it seems that most of your results are based on the on the fitting of your of your sorry. It seems that most of your results are or will be based on the on the fitting of your uh, resist, resting state model, right? Your network. But uh, so it's quite critical that the parameters are, are well fit. But what do you mean first by resting state? Is the brain ever at rest? I don't think so. There is always input coming from breathing or whatever. Uh, you told also in the introduction that there are not only neurons, but many other uh, factors that influence. So at the end, isn't it a bit like if you want to, like you have a big network with a particular dynamics, and you try to understand the dynamics of only a sub-part. So you, you isolate this sub-part, you fit the parameter of this sub-part so that it matches the dynamic of this sub-part inside the big network, but then the parameter you will find will be not the appropriate. So how do you ensure that it's not the case and that your, net, your network? Because for example, when you inject noise in the system, you see that the activity shut down. It seems a bit contradictory. Yeah. And are you sure that actually your So, so regarding good? resting state, um, this, is, this is something that, this is not a thing about how I've modeled resting state or not. It's a little bit about how the data that I'm using is taken under which condition. So uh, 
for, for this uh, connectivity network, the way they uh, do it, when uh, they put these people inside scanners uh, to do DS, uh, DTI, DSI kind of measurements, and what they tell them as an instruction in resting state is they, that there's no specific instruction, try to close your eyes and quiet yourself down. Of course, no one will quiet themselves down. But that's why you average over different lots of cases, and, and there is a lot of debate over what should be right, the right resting state. However, however, the thing is, in this case, it was structural data. Just because you're at rest or not at rest, the fibers are not going to change. The dynamics will change. This was structural data. So now when I go for the modeling part, so the structural data is fine in that sense. Now when I go for the modeling part, for resting state, the assumption that we make is, that, um, if there was a task, there would be a strong input in one given region corresponding to that function. In resting state, we assume that there's no specific input given to one region, but there's just noise to given to overall everything. So that's the way it's... Yes, it can be. But unless we know better, we have to assume the thing that makes least assumption. The other point uh, regarding uh, the fitting of the parameters, it's no good idea. Uh, in fact, it would, it, it's, a, it's a good point you raise, but um, my guess is you have to see it more carefully. If you try to fit local parameters first and then try to match the thing like this by piece by piece, you'll, in the end you'll see things are probably very wrong. Uh, because the way local things interact with each other, you cannot just fit things in isolation. You probably have to fit them together and have better ways to do that. Luckily here, what we looked at is we only had two, had two parameters and both of them were global parameters, which means that we kept more or less the, the thing uniformly. In future, when there's better, better experiments and better literature, you might be able to say uh, that maybe the, the local connectivity in one region is much more than another or one region is more noisy than another. Unless we don't know that, we cannot assume anything, so we assume the same noise. So, so, the, so that's why I said this is work in progress for those, for those and some more reasons. How a real brain uh, reacts to perturbation versus your network? The, the problem with that is the, you, you'll, be able, you'll be able to get the real behavior in many, many ways. You won't be able to decide which of those many ways is the way unless you get some more information at a microscopic level. So that's again not going to go too far. So, so who, who of you in the room actually understood what Sergis was really talking about? <laughs> okay, well I see one finger, two, three, right? Four. So, so but this is important, right, for two reasons. Of course, if you don't understand something, you have to raise your hand and speak about it. But the point is that what you're looking at here is the future. And um, in the form of success and his slides. So the, the point, so get worried. Now the point is, look, the brain is like this alien technology, right? It is this piece of matter, and frankly, we have no idea how it works. We deal with, with clinicians, people who work in neurosurgery. If you really are in, in th on the ground in what these people do, we're largely guessing, okay? If you have an epilepsy patient who put electrodes in their brains, to identify the, the locus that generates the, the seizures, that basically it's a fishing expedition, okay? People are guessing. So if, if, if you do neurosurgery, you have to remove a tumor, do we really know where we can lesion the brain without causing long-term damage? No, we don't, okay? So we look at this alien technology, you really don't know how it works. And if you enter the surgery room with your textbook in your hands, you're gonna fail for sure, okay? This is the state of the art, this is where we are. So all the concepts of use so far are just failing. All right, so a standard concept, certainly in understanding pathology, disease, either psychopathology, that uh, might be addiction or schizophrenia or dementia, the standard model was always very, very simplified. And that's basically how you repair your, your washing machine at home, right? It's mechanical. There's a, there's a single mechanical perturbation to the system, and if I identify it, I slam the washing machine just hard enough, the pieces will fall in place, it will work again. So you have a, a spatially localized perturbation to the system, a broken brain if you want, that then gives rise to all these deficits. It's not working, right? Our interventions in, in, in any of these pathologies, take, take addiction, or they don't work. We have no idea what to do, okay? so. So we can keep on marching to that, to that beat, or we can really change our tune. And this is now what Serxis is talking about. So what Serxis is showing to you is that 
we really have to reconceptualize Uh, that we have to reconceptualize how we think about this alien technology. Right? So this alien technology of the brain is in some more a network of networks. We don't know how many networks we have to distinguish. We don't, also as Jose already told us yesterday, what's the, is there any hierarchy in that system or not? Are the what are the hierarchical relations? How static are they? Are they dynamic? We don't know. But what we do know, and for that, Circus gave you, so, gave you already some really good examples, it's a network of networks. That means our whole language, our formalisms, all have to be changed and must be developed because we don't have them. If you go back to the physics we have and the models we have coming from that domain, we're back in the broken brain. It's not working, okay? So this is why this is important and that's also why this is confusing because to describe an alien technology, we use alien concepts. We have to get exposed to them, we have to get our heads around the information theory we need for the complexity measurement for that, to understand how we can think about networks of networks. Because subjectively, the brain as we experience it as individuals does not really facilitate this conceptualization. Our brain forces us to categorize, to unify. Remember, the stream of consciousness is unitary, it's not probabilistic, etc. We have biases in how we look at reality. We have to overcome those, right? So, so what you look at right now is this transition point. We are right now in this transition point of high entropy where we know we got to change, but we don't really know what that end point is. That's why there's nothing wrong with not understanding stuff. What's wrong is that you don't raise questions to challenge success here. But what you're looking at is our transition into the future of really get making progress in understanding how brains work, and that's why this is important, and it's hard, because we have very little foundation to really enter into this easily, all right? So that's why we're gonna have then the second part after lunch, where you're all gonna have questions for success to make his life difficult, but what you're looking at is success showing you a glimpse of the future. All right, it's so okay, let's have lunch, me. let's ma make progress, make I his I life difficult. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Daniel, <laughs> success. <laughs> and Anna, what time do we reconvene? Anna. 3.30 here yeah. to hold hands and hum. All right. Change your life.